What's up, everybody? It is week two of our series goals. And guess what we're talking about? Setting and achieving our goals. But we're not talking about like just any kind of goals. We're talking about some God-sized goals. These goals that are overarching, that are life-defining, and the reason that we are here. God has placed you here for a great purpose. And I believe that when we set goals, we help determine what that calling is in our life and our great purpose. I know for each of us, we set goals all the time. You set goals to maybe complete homework by seven o'clock so that you can go and play Animal Crossing, or you set a goal to make the volleyball team. You set a goal for your crush to notice you. We set goals for ourselves every single day. The thing that's difficult with goals is not necessarily setting the goals. I think it is getting stuck. When we get stuck with our goals, how do we get unstuck? It reminds me of, I don't know if you remember, the little squirrel from Ice Age. He had this just ridiculous overbite. I can't even remember his name, um, but he always chased after this acorn. And it seemed like he would get it and then something ridiculous would happen and he would lose it. Or he would finally be able to wrap his, rounds, uh, his arms around it and once again he loses it. It's always within reach, but never, he's never quite able to get the acorn. Many times it feels like that's us. It feels like that is us trying to achieve our goals and moving towards our goals. We feel like it is so easy to get stuck, to get into a rut and not know the next step that we need to take. And that is what we're going to be looking at today is the most important thing of all is how to get unstuck when we've gotten stuck in our goals. And for many of us, it's going to be requiring us to take time to create a plan. Reminds me of this book called The Little Prince, and it's written by Antoine de Saint uh, Esbury. I don't even know how you pronounce his last name, but he's an amazing guy. He written uh, this this children's book, and in it has a quote that I love, and it says, "A goal without a plan is just a wish. A goal without a plan is just a wish." Think about your life. Think about the things that you want to achieve this year in 2021. Maybe it's a spiritual goal. Maybe you want to build on your relationship with Jesus all the more. And so you've set out to spend more time with him. Well, that's going to require a plan. How are you going to spend more time with him? And what is that going to look like? Are you going to pray more? Are you going to do a devotional? Are you going to spend more time reading scripture? What is it that it's going to look like for you to spend more time with Jesus? That requires a plan. If you think maybe physically you want to get stronger, you want to get faster, you want to learn a new skill, well, all of those requires a plan for you to figure out which muscle group to work and how hard to work them and what is it going to look like for you to get stronger and faster. What's your goal? How fast do you want to be and how strong do you want to be? All those things require goals. It requires a plan to achieve that. If you want to be a better friend, if you want to be a kinder friend, if you want to be nicer to your family, more loving to your brother and sister, well, all of those things are going to require a plan. And I know that as we're talking about Jesus and trying to follow him, it feels so weird to be talking about goals and plans when we're talking about Jesus. Like that, those, te- those two usually don't go together. But I believe that, it, that God has set you here for a great purpose. It is your goal. It is your calling. And that means that we're going to have to put a plan in place, especially as we start to look at the story of Nehemiah. I'm reminded of when I was called into ministry. For me, I was called into student ministry um, pretty much out of the blue. And I stepped in not knowing what to do, what to expect. Everything was new to me, which meant it was completely scary and I was learning on the job. And as I look back, Jesus had orchestrated my life in some amazing ways. And as we're going to see with Nehemiah, he's going to orchestrate your life in some amazing ways. He equipped me with some amazing skills. Like I love to build relationships and talk to people. I think I can talk to a wall and ask questions to a wall and build a relationship with it. Our teacher back in high school wanted to prove a point because I was talking too much. 
And so she set me beside this uh, student that was the number one in our class, and she had like a 6.0 GPA, like something crazy ridiculous. Took the hardest classes, aced every single thing. To, for her to get like an A minus was unheard of. And so she sat me beside her thinking that I wouldn't talk and that she wouldn't talk to me. Well, within the first day, I got her to start talking to me, and we got in trouble multiple times for talking uh, from that teacher. I love being able to build relationships with people. That's what God skilled me to do. Now think about that, that he gave me people in my life that pushed me and, and pulled me into the direction that I'm in now. I think about my friends that were there for me when I was going through difficulty or when I was struggling or when I was questioning um, my ministry and, and what God was calling me to. Like, is Jesus really calling me into student ministry? And I think about a professor where he gave me this passion for Jesus. I think about the, the student pastors that he set me up with as I was learning about what it meant to be a student pastor. They were there to help give me a, a, a guide, a blueprint on how to do student ministry. God orchestrated my life and moved in my life in some amazing ways for me to answer this lifelong goat goal, this God-sized goal, greatest of all time goal um, that I had when I was your age. See, when I was your age in high school, um, in ninth grade, I had something deep within me. I didn't want to um, fade into the background I wanted to impact and shape this world. I didn't want my life to be dull, and I wanted to impact those around me. And if you had asked me back then what that meant, I couldn't have told you. That's all I knew, is that there was this deep passion for me to help others, and for my life to mean something. And as I moved into college, Jesus took a hold of my life and reshaped it, and that goal was still very much there, but it had changed because I wanted for me, myself, to, to, to help introduce others to life, to help point them to Jesus. And now I stand before you this night telling you that my goat goal is still very much alive. And now I'm getting to pour into students and to follow Jesus in some amazing ways. He has shaped it and transformed it in some, but the very core of that is still the same. And that meant that I had to use the things around me. I meant I had to use build relationships and friendships with the people around me. It meant that I had to trust in what God had gifted me with. And all of that requires a plan. That's what I want us to look, like, to look at tonight with the story of Nehemiah. If you remember from last week, Nehemiah was uh, this kind of out of nowhere leader for God's people. He comes in about 140 years after God's people had completely, their land had completely been destroyed, burned to the ground. Their city was no more. And now they had been dispersed and moved all throughout the world. But they weren't living back in their home country. Their culture, their laws, everything that made them them was completely gone. And 140 years Later, now where Nehemiah stands is that God's people are starting to return back to the land. Um, but they've run into some major issues and they've gone back to the capital city, um, but there's no walls. And they've met a lot of opposition and now they're in this weird limbo because they know that they need to start following Jesus and trust him and have the faith that, that he's there and that he wants them there. Um, but they're not doing anything about it. And so Nehemiah hears this news and he's brokenhearted and he's going to set out on his life goal to change the world by bringing God's people back to them and to build the walls of Jerusalem. And that's what we're going to look at today. What's crazy and I, what I love about this story is that Nehemiah was made for, for big things. And in our life, many times we think that the people that are super talented or the people that are super athletic, the people that are super smart, the people that are great leaders, and there's just a lot of people that like to go to them, the popular people, those are the ones that are made to change the world. Those are the ones that are going to do great things with our life. And so many times what we do is, well, we buy into the lie that, that I'm here just to, to fade, that I'm insignificant, that I'm not really made to do amazing and great things that God doesn't really care about me. There's better plans for other people, but God doesn't love me as much as the other people. God doesn't want to use me as much as someone else, and so I'm just going to fade. And that's simply not true. That is a lie from 
the enemy. You are loved. You are cared for. Look at Ephesians 2. 10 it says for we are God's masterpiece you are God's masterpiece he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do good things that he planned for us long ago you are designed for God-sized goals you are designed and made to change the world to impact it positively to help shape and change people's lives God loves you you are his masterpiece he has spent days, weeks, months, and years into forming who you are today. And he's going to continue to shape you as you move on. He is proud of you. He wants to display you and show you off to everybody. Your calling is a part of that. But you won't move forward and take the next step within your goal if you don't believe that God has made you to do something special that you were placed here in 2021 to do something great and amazing. God could have placed you at any point in history and given you any family, and yet you're here. What is it that God is trying to do in your life now? And when we sit down to think of that, I think a great way to start chewing on what God wants us to do with our lives is to think about the goals, to think about our passions and the things that burden us. When I answered the call into ministry, I wanted to be in ministry because the church burdened me. I had fallen through the cracks many times at churches. I had been the one that was all on the outside looking in, and that broke my heart. And that is why I wanted to go into student ministry, because I always have felt that students I easily get overlooked. And that's not the case, and it's not meant to be. And so that is the burden that was laid on me. And that is the goal for my life. But you are loved. You are His masterpiece, and He has a great purpose for you. I want you to say these things with me because sometimes we need to remind ourselves that because we don't tell ourselves these things many times. Many times we tell ourselves that, that we're losers, that, that we stink, and man, if I was good enough, then this things would happen. We beat ourselves up over and over and over again. So I want you to say with me in your room, right in front of the camera, to say that I am loved. Say it. Say, I am loved. I am loved. Think about it another way. Say, I am significant. Repeat with me. I am significant. Jesus calls you his masterpiece. He has died for him to be able to shape you into something beautiful and amazing. You are not a disgrace. You are not insignificant. God has placed you here to do something amazing. And as we're talking about goals, we can't set goals for ourselves until we believe that we are who God says we are, that we are loved and that we are significant. And that when we trust and turn to Him, He's going to do some amazing things in our life. So believe it. Nehemiah is a great person to look to. If you're struggling with believing in yourself, if you're struggling with wanting to do something great but not knowing how, look at this cupbearer, this food tester for the king. He brings God's people back to Jesus and he rebuilds a wall. In no world should that ever happen. That's a crazy, ridiculous story. And yet Nehemiah is here leading God's people, doing some amazing things. But it starts with him trusting in God and knowing that he was placed on the earth for some significant and great purpose. So we're going to talk about creating a plan for you to achieve your goal. But I want you to believe deep in your heart that you are made for a great purpose. I want you to think about it this way. Um, last year it snowed and, and Ezra is three years old. So last year he was, he was two. And so he was understanding and playing with snow really truly for the first time. And what I loved about it is that when we went outside to play in the snow, um, I would step in front of him, and so my footprints would, would be marked in the snow. So I'm walking, and my footprints are there in the snow. And Ezra, being a playful, amazing little boy that he is, 
He wanted to follow in his dad's footsteps. That he would try to jump and move in my footprint. Many times we set goals for ourselves. You set a goal for yourself. You feel the calling in the pool to do something amazing. And you look out and you feel like it's a black abyss. And you're like, I don't feel like if I take that next step, I'm just going to fall. I don't know what to do next. And if we look at Ephesians 2.10, that God goes before us and prepares good works. It is like that snow print that Jesus has gone before us. The snow prints are already there. It is up to us to take that leap of faith to fall and to make our jump into that footprint. He's prepared the good work for you. He's prepared the good work for you as a student in your school, in your classes, whether you're virtually or physically able to join. He's prepared the good works for you as a son or as a daughter. He's prepared the good works for you as a brother or a sister. He's prepared the good works for you as you're an employee. He's prepared the good works for you as you are in school and doing sports. In every area of your life, there are good works prepared for you. You're not looking out into a black abyss, not knowing what to do. Jesus has already stepped in front of you. And it's up to us to take that leap of faith, to believe him. And this is true same is true with our goals. So let's look at Nehemiah and learn the true power of what it means to plan. That planning is a spiritual thing. It is trusting God that He's given you this goal and you're going to take it serious. You're going to trust Him. So let's check it out. In Nehemiah 1, 4, and 11, these are the same verses we covered last week. But when he had heard these this terrible news about what's happening to Jerusalem and God's people, this is how he responded. Nehemiah 1.4 says, When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, I fasted, and I prayed to the God of heaven. Check out Nehemiah 1.11. O oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant my, me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. In those days... I was the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah, when he had heard the news, knew that God was stirring in his heart to do something about it. His goal had been set. Many times we're scared and nervous because we want God to lay out these step-by-step instructions, laying out the blueprint of how every single thing is going to work in our life. Like, God, if I follow you into this goal, how, what is it going to be like? What's going to happen in my life if I, if I do these things for you? But Nehemiah doesn't do that. Nehemiah doesn't wait for the step, step-by-step instructions. He spends his days praying, yes, but he knows and trusts that Jesus has laid this on his heart. And so he does something amazing. He starts to plan. Nehemiah is planning while he's praying because it is this amazing movement of faith for him. He is trusting Jesus that this crazy, ridiculous goal of going back to Jerusalem, leaving the king, which is even unheard of in itself, to go back and lead people he's never met, to do something he's never even done before or doesn't even know how to, it's ridiculous. It's crazy. And Nehemiah is here doing it because he has faith that God has called him to it. So a great way for you to show faith in Jesus is no matter how crazy it is, it's a God-sized goal, it's something that is crazy in and of itself, is for you to start planning while you're praying. Nehemiah planned while he prayed. So for us, we need to plan while we pray. To trust Jesus. And to know that we don't need to make or to have the step-by-step instructions. We don't need to know 100% of the plan. But that God has simply called us to take the next step. So in your God-sized goal, what is your next step? What is it that God's calling you to do? And check out what Nehemiah keeps going on. I'm going to read Nehemiah 2, 1 through 9. Early the following spring, this is months later, so Nehemiah spent months planning and praying. Early in the, mo- in the following spring, in the month of Nisan, during the, day, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was serving the king his wine. I had never before appeared sad in his presence. So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified. 
But I replied, Long live the king. How can I not be sad for the city where my ancestors are buried in his ruins and the gates have been destroyed by fire? The king asked, How can I help you? With a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, If it please the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah and rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. The king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked, How long will you be gone? When will you return? After I told him how long I would be gone, the king agreed to my request. I also said to the king, If it pleases the king, let me have letters addressed to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, instructing them to let me travel safely through their ter- territories on my way to Judah. And please give me a letter addressed to Asaph, the manager of the king's forest, instructing him to give me timber. I will need it to make beams for the gates of the temple's fortress, for the city walls, and for the house for myself. The king granted these requests because the gracious hand of God was on me. And when I came to the governor's, the province west of the Euphrates River, I delivered the king's letters to them. The king, I should add, had sent along army officers and horsemen to protect me. I know what you're thinking. Bruce, why in the world are you reading me these incredibly boring details about Nehemiah going to talk to the king? It's really simple. Nehemiah prepared in great detail what he was going to do. His plan required a lot of preparation. He didn't just casually plan it. For Nehemiah, this was this act of worship that he could, that God would even think of him to build a wall, that God would even consider Nehemiah to do something that crazy and that ridiculous, to do something to bring God's people back and to provide them safety. Well, Nehemiah took that as, as a serious calling. It wasn't something that was casual for him. It was his life's purpose. It was his way to worship Jesus. And so when you have these God-sized goals in your life, we are called to prepare. It was months after, and Nehemiah spent many days praying. And I love the fact that it says that Nehemiah was terrified. <laughs> we're going to be in the middle of our goals, and we're going to be in the middle of our plans, but... It's going to be okay to be terrified. It's going to be okay to be scared. It's going to be okay to be nervous. And so in that, Nehemiah looks to Jesus. But I love it. Look at, I mean, look at, look at how he is prepared. So when the king asked Nehemiah why he looked sad, Nehemiah had an answer. And when the king asked Nehemiah what he wanted, he had an answer prepared. When the king asked Nehemiah how long it was going to take, he had a time frame. And when Nehemiah was thinking about how great this was going and the king asked him if there was anything else he could do for him, he had requests already thought about. Nehemiah used what God had given him, his skills, his ability to plan and prepare for him to achieve his goal. And so in your life, you have some skills, you have God-given abilities that you can do. So maybe you're super creative or maybe you are a super planner and you love to prepare. Maybe you're just spontaneous and you love being able to just fly in the moment. Whatever it is that God has given you, use it. Nehemiah prepared while he planned. He knew that God's calling was big and that meant that his responsibility in that was to prepare. So our responsibility is to prepare in our planning. Look at Nehemiah 2, 10 through 20. This is after Nehemiah finally is able to go to Jerusalem. This is what happened. It says, So I arrived at Jerusalem. Three days later, I slept out during the night, taking only a few others with me. I had not told anyone but about the plans God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. We took no pack animals with us except the donkey I was riding. After dark, I went out through the valley walls and uh, burned gates. I'm sorry, I went out through the valley um, gate, past the jackal's well, and over to the dung gate to inspect broken walls and burned gates. Then I went to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but my donkey wouldn't get through the rubble. So, though it was still dark, I went up to the Kidron Valley instead, inspecting the wall before I was turned back and entered the valley gate. The city officials did not know I had been out there or what I was doing, for I had not yet said anything to anyone about my plans. I had not yet spoken to the Jewish leaders, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or anyone else in the administration. But now I said to them, you know very well what trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. 
Then I told them about the gracious hand that God had been on me and about my conversation with the king, and they replied at once, Yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem the Arab heard of our plan, they scoffed contemptuously. What are you doing, and are you rebelling against the king, they asked? I replied, the God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding the wall. But you have no share, legal right, or historic claim in Jerusalem. Nehemiah sets out to achieve his goal, and yet he faces great opposition. The people that are there ruling over Jerusalem for the king don't like this. The powerful men in the city aren't really keen on this happening. And so they set themselves up against Nehemiah. And many times when we have our goals set before us and everything's looking great, something happens, some kind of opposition comes up, whether it's doubting ourselves or maybe it is someone else that sets themselves against us like Nehemiah, or maybe it is a situation that we're put in that sets itself against us. You're going to face opposition and opposition is not a bad thing. It is not a bad thing and it is not something to be fearful of when you face opposition. But did you notice what Nehemiah did? Nehemiah found some, a few good men, shared his plan, and they helped him eventually achieve this amazing goal. Nehemiah planned for the opposition. And we should plan for opposition, knowing that God is with us. And he is greater in us than he who is in the world. Jesus is with you. I want you to see what I have here. Um, I don't know. Here we go. I don't know if you can see it. God has given you building blocks to achieve your goals. He's given you things around you. He's given himself. And so I want you to think about your goal. What is it in your life? What is this God goal that deserves a plan? A plan that you're going to be planning while you're praying, a plan that you're going to be preparing while you're planning, and a plan where you're going to plan for opposition. What goal in your life deserves for you to plan around? God has given you some things around you, using the normal everyday things that are around you. God has given you some great things to go ahead and achieve your goal, to take that first step, that good work that he has prepared for you. He's already set in motion for that to happen. The very first thing that God has given you is himself. God is with you every step of the way. He has set you on this goal and believes in you. So think of your first building block as God himself, that you can turn to him, that you can look at him, and that he's going to walk beside you. The second building block that God gives you is yourself that He has given you something amazing, that you have skills, you have passions, you have this amazing brain of yours that helps you plan and prepare. God has given you some amazing things in and of yourself that you can achieve your goal with. Next, God has given you resources. God has given you maybe money, maybe opportunities, maybe a platform on social media, God has given you things around you that you can start using. What is it that you need to achieve that goal? Do you need money? Do you need more uh, resources? Do you need social media? Do you need opportunities? What is it that you need to help achieve your goal? Because I believe if you look around, God's already got it there in place for you. And lastly, God has given you others. Your friends, your family a coach, a teacher, a small group leader. God has given you the things around you to help build blocks so that you can achieve your goal. The question I have for you is the building blocks are around you. Just like Nehemiah, God has given you a God-sized goal. The question is, is what are you going to build? Let's pray. Jesus, we turn to you and we are so thankful for everything you do for us. Lord, you are so good to us and we love you. God, thank you for using us that we are your masterpiece and that you have prepared good works for us. So Lord, help us to create a plan to prepare and to look to you when we face opposition. Jesus, we love you and we lift up our time together now and we ask these things in your name. Amen. All right, if you look in the chat box, I'll be dropping in the Zoom link for you to be able to join us for small groups. Thank you so much and you guys have a great day.